Good morning, and thank you for attending today's Earth Day celebration. I am Bill McKim, CEO here at Midland Power Cooperative, and I'm really pleased to have a number of members joining us here in person, as well as hopefully a good contingent watching online. Just, uh, you always got to start these meetings with a few housekeeping items. So for all the folks here, directly across the hall is the restrooms. And then uh, always important for me as I attend meeting, the snacks are over here to the right as well. You're free to, to grab those. And then um, as we have questions or if you want to catch somebody afterwards, our energy services team uh, is here in the office. And so you can uh, visit with them. I have Roger Hammond over here, uh, Larry Belke, Kayla McKim in the back. So they'll be able to answer the tough questions for you. And then we also, for those that want to stick around, we're excited. Uh, Ames Ford Lincoln, a big thanks to them. They were willing to bring out a, a brand new F-150 Ford Lightning. So if you'd like to uh, take a look at and and uh, just maybe crawl through a, an electric vehicle and see what that's like, um, you're glad to, you're, I have an opportunity to do that. Um, if you have questions, so here for those here in the audience, be free to you know, raise, raise your hand and ask a question. We'll get that answered. You can catch somebody afterwards. For those of you online, you can uh, leave a comment or your question in the comment box, and then we'll share those with the presenters and try to get your answers there. As you'll hear this morning, Midland Power and our wholesale power providers have taken huge steps over the past two decades to help deliver on our collective mission of providing safe, reliable, and affordable sustainable and sustainable power. Since its inception in 1970, Earth Day has been used to raise awareness of the need to be good stewards for our natural resources. I'm old enough to be in elementary school when that started, so I can remember those things. That's a mission Midland Power and our wholesale power providers take very seriously. Midland Power has a long history of promoting technologies to both benefit the environment and our members' bottom lines. From our early promotion of ground and air source heat pumps to our more recent community solar program, Midland is an advocate of energy efficiency, and balancing renewable energy with reliability. Likewise, Central Power Cooperative and Core Belt Power Cooperative, both headquartered here in Iowa, are, are, are our horsehole power providers, and they've been working diligently to smartly incorporate additional wind and solar energy into their generation portfolios. As member-owned elect cooperatives, we're all committing to helping you, our member owners, save money on your energy bills, while also improving the quality of life in rural Iowa. That's why we work tirelessly to maintain the reliable and affordable service you depend on. It's also why we host educational presentations like these. We sincerely want to be seen as your trusted source for energy information. So thanks again for joining us today. It's a little cool outside, so it's a good day to be inside. So I appreciate you coming today and for listening online. And so it's now my honor to introduce Mr. Roger Hammond, who will be the MC for today's activities. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Roger Hammond, member service manager with uh, an, an energy services manager with Midland Power Cooperative. Um, as Bill mentioned, Midland has been an advocate for energy efficiency and electrification since our formation in 1992. It all happens to be about the time that our first speaker started working for Corn Belt Power Cooperative in Humboldt. Uh, for more than 34 years, Jim Sayers worked for Corn Belt Power, leading public relations, marketing information services, and energy efficiency efforts. Along the way, he became a strong advocate for and a believer in member-owned cooperatives and the cooperative difference. After retiring from Corn Belt Power, he proudly became a beneficial electrification ambassador, sharing stories and experiences about the advantages of living better electrically. So with that, please help me in uh, welcoming and join me in welcoming Jim Sayers from Corn Belt Power, formerly of Corn Belt Power. Thanks, Jim. Good morning. I've got a mic here, I think. Okay. Good morning. I'm going to add my welcome to that, those from the cooperative here. And this is my first time in the building for Midland Power this morning, so I had a tour already, and it's good to be here and welcome you. As I began, my name is Bill Sayers. I'm a volunteer ambassador with a group called the Beneficial Electrification League. And that's pretty much what people do when they get old and they leave the co-op and they still want to talk about electricity. So that's why I'm here. 
A little bit about me, though, two things. Number one, as was mentioned, I retired from Corn Belt Power about five years ago now. And often when I speak, I sometimes say, you will remember, and then I realize not everyone in the audience will remember because I do. So sometimes I speak uh, from my experience, but not everyone has that experience. The second thing about me is that I have always believed in energy efficiency. The box of bulbs you see in the slide there, I found those out of my barn about a month ago. They were old incandescent light bulbs. I took out of my house, I was so excited to put in CFLs, but I couldn't throw away the old bulbs because they still worked, right? And I might, I might use them someday. Well, I found them in my barn, like I said, a month ago. They'd been there about 10 years. You can see they're pretty old and mixed. So I did throw those away and my wife was happy about that. But in my basement, I still have a box of CFLs that still work too, you know, if I might need those. Question, some of you I know were around in 1970. Where were you in 1970? Earth Day number one, April 1970. The picture at the right hand side there, it's out of our high school yearbook, a very poor picture, but it's about our senior project to promote Earth Day. Our senior class decided what should we do to celebrate Earth Day? The very first one, what should we do? We decided to pick up garbage around the community. And so all day we had our parents pick ups and friends. We went around the city of Humboldt to pick up garbage we collected in the city park and that was our Earth Day celebration. Earth Day today though is a lot more than picking up garbage, isn't it? Whoever thought of energy efficiency back in 1970 or cared Whoever heard of carbon sequestration back in 1970? That was a new term. Other terms we know now, we talk about recycling, didn't so much then, nutrient reduction strategies. What does that mean? We didn't think about that then either. So Earth Day started a long time ago, but its efforts continue today in a lot of ways, including ways of electric cooperatives. What is beneficial electrification? It's an important part of almost everything we do, and we often take for granted how central it is to our quality of life. Thanks to past electrification efforts, the benefits of electricity reach nearly all Americans. So if electrification has already happened in the past, why are we talking about beneficial electrification now? It's because large groups of stakeholders are realizing more and more benefits as new electric products help consumers save money, become more convenient, and as electricity becomes cleaner and greener. For consumers, electric products can be fun and exciting, like electric vehicles, can offer convenience like smart homes, and can save money due to the incredible energy efficiency of new products, like advanced electric water heaters and heat pumps that heat and cool homes. The use of electricity is also an essential strategy for reducing carbon dioxide emissions associated with climate change. The emissions resulting from the generation of electricity have already declined by 29%, and it keeps getting better. This means that every single device that uses electricity has gotten better for the environment over time, just by being plugged into the electric grid as electricity gets greener. For utilities, beneficial electrification provides an important opportunity to engage consumers, deliver more services, and help the environment. A win-win-win scenario. What is beneficial electrification? Electrification provides many benefits that are well known. Different stakeholders throughout communities bring different perspectives of how electrification benefits them. Through a broad coalition, we have established a description of beneficial electrification that a wide group of stakeholders can agree on. If electrifying an end use satisfies at least one of these conditions without adversely affecting the others, it is clearly beneficial. There are abundant opportunities for beneficial electrification, and you can be part of this exciting effort. We hope you can join us in our mission to promote beneficial electrification. Learn more at www.be-league.com.
keeps getting better. This means that every single device that uses electricity has gotten better for the environment over time, just by being plugged into the electric grid and electricity gets green. For utilities, beneficial electrification provides an important opportunity to engage consumers, deliver more services, and help the environment. A win-win-win scenario. What is beneficial electrification? Electrification provides many benefits that are well known. Different stakeholders throughout communities bring different perspectives on how electrification benefits them. Through a broad coalition, we have established a description of beneficial electrification that a wide group of stakeholders can agree on. Electrifying an MP satisfies at least one of these conditions without adversely affecting the others, it is clearly beneficial. There are abundant opportunities for beneficial electrification, and you can be part of this exciting effort. We hope you can join us in our mission to promote beneficial electrification. Learn more at www.pg-league.com. The video talked in general about what is beneficial electrification, but it has four key pillars, as I call them. Saving consumers money over time, benefiting the environment, improving the products we have or the quality of life, and fosters a more robust and resilient electric grid. In other words, does not hurt the electric grid that we are so dependent upon. Those are very high level definitions, so I'd like to look at it a little more simply. This is Jim Sayers. I think I'm two cycle engine motor challenged. Why is it that I buy a chainsaw in this case one year, it works fine, you know, and make it home. The next year, and I do all this stuff, I put the stable in the gas and everything I'm supposed to do in the next year. This happens. I don't know why. And so then I take it to town and try to get it fixed. Well, that's before beneficial electrification. But then I talked to my friend Skip Christensen in Humboldt, who said, you know what? I have an electric chainsaw, 18 volt battery powered, perfect for someone like me that doesn't cut down huge trees. And so I'm a happy camper. So beneficial electrification makes a difference for consumers. Some of you have been around electricity a long time. Some of us in co-op land have, and we are asked, what's the benefit of electricity? And all these kind of words start spewing out of our mouths now, just automatically. Better quality of life. It's 24-hour servant, a hired hand. It's convenient, safe, clean, economical. All those things are the benefits of electricity we've talked to about for many, many years. And over the years, electric cooperatives and other utilities in particular have promoted cool electric stuff. What would happen today if we took all our electric devices out on our lawns just to show them off like this old picture from the past? Probably a lot of our lawns wouldn't even hold everything anymore. But in the past, we promoted electric technology because of its benefits to our members and consumers. So we have added, through beneficial electrification, one more point about the value of electricity, and that is one that's called environmentally beneficial, as you just heard from the video. Why or how is electricity beneficial environmentally? Through load management, through storage, through batteries, through new and renewable generation utilities are installing, through special rates to encourage off-peak charging, for example, through policies, metering, and on and on through new technologies, which is one thing I am very excited about today. As I mentioned, though, I'm very uh, interested in energy efficiency. And a lot of us in the co-op world have been promoting EE for a long time, haven't we? Through heat pumps, as Bill mentioned, through lighting, through all the technology. Beneficial electrification is not the same as efficiency, though. It supports it, but it's not the same. Because, and this is a big because, beneficial electrification encourages what we in the utility world called fuel switching. In the past, we could say we promote energy efficiency, but it has to re result in less electric use. Beneficial electrification says no. What we are doing is encouraging electric use to replace fossil fuel use. If we do that, it represents an opportunity for sales for the co-ops and for the utilities. This uh, chart just shows what might happen based on the past or future predictions especially if beneficial electrification encourages, say, more transportation, increased sales for utilities. 
And often if you mention environmental and utilities, a lot of people have the perception of the left-hand photo, don't they? They picture power plants spewing particulates in the air, all those kinds of things, which may have been true many, many, many years ago before environmentalism and awareness in the utility business. However, the right side picture is becoming more and more common. The video we saw had this chart in it. It's showing uh, pounds of CO2 as the vertical axis over time. Pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. So over time, uh, since 2005, on the left-hand side of the screen, the amount of CO2 as uh, environmental released from generation of electricity has gone down per megawatt hour, kilowatt hour, however you want to define it. Electricity, no matter what you plug in today, is cleaner than it was in the past. This chart is another look at that. It says at the top, renewables became the second most prevalent electric source in 2020. If you look at the chart, the top big bar, the yellow one or brown one, it's coal generation. On the increase since 1950, significantly has gone down in recent years. Natural gas, the light blue, has gone up. Renewables, which is the green line, you can see that has creeped up over the years, and as this says, through uh, the Energy Information Administration, surpassed uh, all except the natural gas in 2020. And what are renewables? I think we've thought of dam hydropower for many, many years. That's the blue part of this chart. Above that, we have uh, a biomass, which is always there. We have geothermal, which is from the ground geothermal. But look at the growth in wind and solar in the last few years. And that is something that has been a big change in utilities. A couple of busy charts. The left one is the US. The right one is Iowa. Somebody would say, well, what are these gases, these greenhouse gases we've been talking about, and where do they come from? Uh, let's look at the left-hand chart. What's the biggest piece there? Well, you see kind of the middle electric generation. However, that has gone down, as we mentioned in the other slide. Transportation, the piece at the bottom, the green-blue bar, that is a significant part of the greenhouse gas emissions today. And I think represents an opportunity for beneficial electrification. Industry is green, and above that you see residential, commercial, and agricultural. So that is the U.S., and it represents, I think, the opportunity for electrification for us as we think about the future. On the right-hand side of the chart, it's the Iowa for one year. If you look at the left-hand, agriculture, I think it's 29% is the largest part or responsibility for greenhouse gases. The next one, it's actually, you can't see the letters very well, but it's residential, commercial, industrial. Okay, buildings, heating, cooling buildings. After that, you see the utilities and then transportation, and those examples are shown as well. So those are the sources of the gases, or greenhouse gases, generally speaking. Beneficial electrification seeks to use electricity to try to reduce those.
ever wondered why we do things the way we do them? In fact, why do so many people have fires in their basement to heat their house? Probably because once upon a time, everyone had a fireplace to heat their house, right? But the, the movie, I think the video is trying to ask us a question, why do we do things the way we do them? And is that even a wise thing to do anymore? This is an ad from, I think, the 1960s. It was talking about new electric living. I thought, how exciting is that? It was predicting what might happen in the future for electric use. Your food will cook in seconds instead of hours. Imagine that. Electricity will close your windows at the first drop of rain. Lamps will cut on and off automatically and fit the lighting needs of your rooms. Te television screens, in quotes, will hang on the walls. An electric heat pump will use outdoor air to heat and cool your house in summer. Heat uh, your house in winter and cool it in the summer. A vision. And yet, how much of this vision from the 60s has become reality today? This is a list of targeted electrification technologies put out by the Electric Power Research Institute, which is a national organization representing utilities, uh, co-ops, and industrial utilities, targeting what they see as opportunities for electrification in the future. Residential, you see heat pumps, heat pumps. Commercial, heat pumps and heat pumps. Uh, heat pump heaters dehumidification, a variety of uh, applications for electricity. Industrial, infrared, infrared curing, drying, uh, induction, surface treatment, on and on, and transportation, as we mentioned already. Light duty passenger cars, we've seen that. School buses, also off-road transportation. These are technologies regarded as important. And what's central about a lot of these technologies? That is batteries. Some of you may remember that on the left we see the old first electric screwdriver. I remember that one. It was great. It worked really good until its battery pooped out. You plugged it in. And unfortunately, when the unit wore out, you had to replace the whole unit because it didn't have a replaceable battery. How many things do we have now that are battery powered in daily life? Technology we see all over the place. These are applications of technology in homes, businesses, schools, industry throughout our daily lives. Off-road transportation, farms, airports, train stations, all those kinds of places. A couple of things affecting our electrification today are two federal acts. One was the Infrastructure Act of 2021 and the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act. Both of those acts provide federal dollars for electrification around the United States. Technologies, I'll highlight a few of the favorite ones. Electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, as we know, have increased in number, percentage of sales. Uh, USDOT and labor statistics have shown sales. Currently, EVs represent about 5% of all sales for new passenger vehicles. Milestones projected to increase tremendously. All dependent or maybe supported in many ways on tax credits, the fuel prices, of course, utility programs, a lot of situations that we can support through our utilities. EV registration by state, it's not equal across the United States. And I guess what I would say today is EV adoption will be uh, a transition type of experience like a lot of other technologies. Not everyone supports EV technology for a lot of reasons. Economic might be one, uh, might be political, it might be just preferences, it might be just what they're used to. One key one is what we call range anxiety. How far can a car go on a charge and can you get there and back? The chart at the left shows that most of the miles driven by people in the United States are short mile trips to town, back to town, around town every day, certainly within the transportation range of the range of the vehicles. Charging on rips, trips is a big question. Uh, several organizations, including utilities and co-ops, have established maps to identify where are the chargers if you choose to take a long trip with your EV. School buses. There is a program through EPA started last year through the federal funding that allows schools to receive free electric school buses. In Iowa, 30 buses uh, have been approved for 14 school districts. 
why to reduce the emissions, the cost of transporting students. And as Bill mentioned, our opening, a big deal for co-ops is the home heating and cooling. Typically, a house uses about 25% of its energy for electric use, those appliances and tools. 75% is thermal use. How much of that could be replaced by electricity? The Beneficial Electrification League has the uh, section called Weatherization and Electrification, focusing specifically on how to adopt electric technology for heating and cooling, which we've done for a long time, but remembering that it has to include weatherization or energy efficiency. Co-ops have never promoted using electricity just to spin the meters, we've heard that term a lot, but it's often and importantly associated with the energy efficiency use of those devices in the home. Interesting, just last year in the air conditioning uh, heating field, heat pumps overtook furnaces for the first time. To me, that was an interesting and, of course, as an electric guy, an exciting statistic. What's the goal? Get rid of stuff like this. Two, again, save the member money, improve their quality of life, and become more environmental. As I close today, I will ask what you think are your electric predictions for the future. Sometimes they seem very wild and unbelievable when they're proposed, but reality sometimes turns the other way. Finally, just a little bit of, uh, as I close, about what is the Beneficial Electrification League. It's a national organization supported by NRECA, also the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, an interesting combination of interests from utilities and environmental interests. And it's also supported now through uh, the United States by businesses, heat pump manufacturers, uh, many utilities across the country. And this is my closing slide with some links, but uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to talk about something important to my heart, but I think something that can be uh, providing future value for co-ops and our co-op members. Uh, just really quickly, wh what do you think is the best bang for your buck when you're looking at, uh, you know, changing out your existing heating and cooling system, something like that, moving into more of an electrified system? I mean, um, what, what do you think gives the most impact for a member, you know, if they're looking at making a change? Well, for members making a change in heating and cooling, step number one always is to evaluate your energy efficiency of your home. It doesn't help to put an efficient system in a house that just is going to blow air and heating and cooling out the windows. So I think always EE or energy efficiency is step number one. Uh, after that, evaluate and all the, uh, I will call them high quality and knowledgeable HVAC contractors today have software that can evaluate heating and cooling options, efficiencies and choices, and also project costs. So. I would trust an expert to do that. I would also always ask them, please be sure to include electric options like heat pumps, whether it's air source or geo, because not all the contractors include those necessarily. But start with energy efficiency always, and then look at what you need after that. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, I think it goes without saying that electric co-ops embrace the beneficial electrification concept. Uh, we see a lot, a lot of opportunities for our membership to, to create a healthier home, a better functioning home, a, a more efficient home. So again, thank you, Jim, for all the information on beneficial electrification. <clears throat> So our next two speakers kind of represent two GMTs that we work with. <clears throat> uh, we have Carrie Coons. She's Vice President of Communications and Corporate Relations at uh, Central Iowa Power Cooperative out of Cedar Rapids. And Jake Overding, he's Vice President of Power Supply at Corn Belt Power Cooperative up in Humboldt. Uh, 
Gary joined joined SIPCO in 2015 with over 20 years of experience in communications, marketing, government relations, and community development. And Kerry leads a team of responsible. Excuse me, Kerry leads a team responsible for the strategic direction, development, and management of communications, member services, government relations, and economic development. And Kerry graduated with honors from Drake University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and communications. Uh, Jake Oberding has been with Corn Belt Power since 2009 when he started as a project engineer. He held the position of assistant plant manager at Corn Belt's Earl F. Wisdom Generation Station from 2014 to 2018, and has held his current position of Vice President of Power Supply since 2018. They're going to give us a little take on what the GNTs have in store for us and how we work with the GNTs and what some of those projections are. So please help uh, join me in, in welcoming Carrie Coons and Jake Oberding. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Roger said, I'm Carrie Kuntz with Central Iowa Power Cooperative, more conveniently known as SIPCO across the industry. So SIPCO is a generation and transmission cooperative. We, pro we generate and transmit the energy to our 13 member systems. Midland is one of those systems and provide power. So our service territory stretches 300 miles and diagonally across Iowa. Um, serving 58 counties and nearly 320,000 Iowans are served in approximately 13,000 commercial and industrial accounts. As you can see, it's kind of an odd territory, but that's what happens in Iowa when we have electric service territory that kind of gets carved out in different places across to the GNTs and then your IOUs such as Mid-American and Alliant. SIPCO was an early adopter of wind energy in this state. Um, we were proud to have been that. Back in 2004, SIPCO brought on two megawatts of wind to get started, but it was a great way to bring it into the system and try it. Today, SIPCO's portfolio contains over 317 megawatts of wind energy. Uh, one of the things to note is that we currently have um, Heartland Wind Divide, which came on in 2018. It's a very large project. It's 103.5 megawatts. And when we brought that into the system, it nearly doubled what we had for wind. And it's been a great resource for SIPCO. And since then, we've added an additional 54 megawatts of wind. So we keep adding wind um, into our, so our portfolio, again, bringing you a different type of um, energy that's sustainable and um, appropriate for Iowa. But as we look at that, our portfolio has really changed over the years. Um, you go back to 2007, we were very coal heavy. Um, and it was 53 over 53% of our portfolio. Nuclear was almost 33, and wind was just that 0 0.2 at that time. And then a few others sprinkled in. But the majority of our portfolio was the coal and uh, nuclear. So then fast forward 10 years to 2017, and coal has dropped by 15%, a little over 15%. Nuclear stayed the same at the time, and wind is over 23%. So it's a giant jump in our wind portfolio at that time. And we just started to bring solar in, but it was less than half of a percent of our portfolio at that point. We had brought on uh, six small, new, or excuse me, small solar sites to test it and see how it went on the system. And then we bring that forward to today. So in 2022, where we ended 2022, nuclear is gone. So we were 20% owners of the Dwayne Arnold Energy Center, which was the nuclear plant in Palo, Iowa. And the majority owners made a decision to close that plant down early. So it ceased operation actually in August of 2020, which was um, a loss because it was a great option for us to have that, that nuclear and that consistent energy in the portfolio. But at the same time, our, um, our wind continues to grow, our coal continues to, to decrease, it's down to nearly half 
of what we were in 2007. Um, wind alone is nearly 40% and our solar is at 7%. So we continue to make increases in adding wind and solar into our portfolio with still balancing it with other resources. This is a type of what we have in our portfolio today. So we still have coal, um, it adds stability into the system. We have hydro out of the um, WAPA units. We have wind, we have solar, and then we have natural gas. And our natural gas is what's known as a peaking plant. And we put that in to support our wind and solar operations. So if the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, then the natural gas plant can come online and continue to provide energy for you. Um, but all of this is important. It's important to keep this diversity as our grid develops and changes to support more beneficial electrification in the future, whether it's more homes using a heat pump, people driving EVs or, or any swath of that matter. Um, it allows us to continue to provide that, um, that energy and stability into the electric system. SIPCO um, is a supporter of the EEV adoption. We help that along. We have an EV in our fleet and so that we can test it and see how it works. But at the same point in time, we recognize that that transition will take time and there's going to be, have to be a lot of upgrades to the system to support that wholly. So that's why we support um, diversity in development, diversity in our grid development, uh, and those kinds of things to support what you want to do in your homes and your businesses to electrify um, going further down into the future. It's an important asset for everyone. Um, SIPCO continues to look at additional projects. As I said, we had brought solar on. We brought on a 100 megawatt facility down called Wapalo Solar down in Louisa County. And that added, brought our system up to 7%. We are working on an additional 100 megawatt facility in Lynn County that again, will bring that, continue to bring that up. We'll add about another 7% into the system because of the same size and from the same developer. Um, and we continue to look at additional wind projects but probably going to have to add additional natural gas into the system as well to support those as we move forward. But again, it's the importance of the diversity of the system to support our electrification across Iowa. Any questions? Mm. What's the cost of producing with solar as compared to wind? Um, solar's a little bit cheaper than wind. Um, and so um, it, that, that's it. The difference is, and this is a little bit of a difficult concept for some people, is capacity and energy are two different things if you're not used to working in the system. We, we use an analogy in our office that energy is the horsepower in your car. You got a lot of horsepower, you can go, go, go. Capacity is the fuel in the tank. If there's no, no fuel in the tank, no capacity, you're not going to have the energy. But, what they, but wind and solar are intermittent resources. They can't run 100% of the time. Sun's not shining, wind's not blowing, which is why we keep d dispatchable resources like the natural gas and those kinds of things in our system and think of those as a knob. We can just turn them on and turn them off whenever we want. So, What is the longevity of a wind generation as compared to a solar generation time frame? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Yep, they're both about 20 years. Um, our current solar site, the large one, is at 25 years, but most wind is between 20 and 25. What's your, what's your view on, uh, on, on battery on, and uh, solar and wind for off-peak generation? Yep, we don't have any batteries in our system yet. Um, it is a great expense, and so obviously we want to keep our wholesale power rates down to support Midland and all of our other members. We actually have put in a grant application for one of the federal grants that are out there to put a battery um, on our system and test it. And um, just because of the way the grant's structured, it'll keep the cost lower. So give me another year and a half and we can answer that question a little bit better once it would get in and get built. So. Um, you know, on that last picture, it showed, you know, the solar farm there. Yep. And I noticed we were coming back from Florida last week, and Florida has a lot of that, too. Yes, they do. I mean, they load huge farms, and Georgia. Uh -huh. But I keep wondering, like wind farms, I mean, wind, you, you pay the farmer to put the wind turbine there. Uh -huh. 
why don't we why aren't we putting like solar panels on the top of these flat warehouses that's a really good question and it's an it's an economies of scale and cost so for um, we only have to put one transformer out to run this what we would have to do to put them on each of these individual rooftops and things like that um, would be a lot more ext extensive in cost and again we want to keep our rates lower so we do this now for example like the solar fields the farmers are getting they're getting paid, you know, lease payments just as the winds winds do. And it's all voluntary. Well, that facility is 800 acres. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, they take up more space than you than you really think um, to put in that kind of a size of scale. Oh, no, that's a really good question. And how long will, you say that's how long wind generators and solar fields arrays will, will last? What happens after that? Lifespan is finished. So, maintenance is close to the same um, cost because you you can have one maintenance person for a lot of wind turbines that goes in and do it. Solar, the major maintenance is the, the land, the mowing and things like that around it, and then spot checks on the panels and those kinds of things. But as far as the actual you know, electricity that's flowing there, that's part of our substation systems anyway, so we're doing that. Um, now, what happens when it's done? So when wind turbines go in, there is a lot of concrete in the ground, supporting a lot of weight, and most of that concrete will not come out just because it's too deep. They'll put more dirt and things like that over it. The solar panels, they're pile driven down into the ground. There's no concrete. So when they're done, if you don't, if it's not um, refurbished and had new panels and things like that, but it can all be taken up and taken out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. All right. Any others? Okay. Oh, one more. Hydroelectric in Iowa. Um, so it's a part of the WAPA system, and it runs up and down the Missouri River. And it, the closest one that's actually in Iowa is in South Dakota. That is right on the corner there. But there's multiple dams up and down, and that's been around for decades. So. What about the one in, near Knoxville? That's not part of the WAPA system. That's a private system. You're talking about the one that's at um, Red Rock Lake there? And uh, so that was a private system that was built, and they sell their power to Mid American Energy. Okay. Yep. Any others? All right. Thanks for the questions, guys. Oh, you need this. <laughs>
and you can kind of see how the Corn Belt map lines up with uh, the SIPCO map that Kerry just showed. We're, we're their neighbors to the north. Uh, as the slide shows there, you know, you've heard this before, but obviously our mission is to provide safe, affordable, and reliable power to our membership. And the way we do that is, is the all, above, all of the above approach. Uh, it, it, there is no silver bullet uh, generating source that can accomplish that goal uh, on its own. So it does really take uh, a group of res different types of resources to accomplish that. And so my goal today is to just kind of give you an understanding of some of the, the power generating types that we have in our power supply portfolio, uh, and then how's that how that's changed over the years. So first off, uh, coal resources. Corn Belt has uh, part ownership in three different coal resources located along the Missouri River. Um, one's near Sioux City, Iowa, and two of them are located near Council Bluffs, Iowa. Um, these coal resources, as Kerry mentioned, you know, they're very efficient, they're very reliable, uh, and they do provide um, benefits as being kind of the base of that power supply portfolio. Um, also fuel security, most coal resources have, you know, 30, 60, or even more days of fuel supply sitting right there on site. So uh, very reliable resources for us. Hydropower, the picture may look familiar from the previous presentation. Uh, Corn Belt also purchases hydropower from WAPA, the Western Area Power Administration, through their facilities on the Missouri River, uh, located throughout South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana. Um, again, hydropower is an excellent source of low cost, low emissions uh, power. Wind purchases. So Corn Belt does not own and operate any wind power. We do have purchase agreements, though, with folks that do own and operate uh, wind farms. Uh, we have three facilities that we purchase from through Northwest Iowa. Um, again, a very low cost power supply, free fuel. Uh, just it, unfortunately, it's only available if the wind is blowing. Um, in our area, you know, we talk about capacity factors. So the wind in our area has a capacity factor on average of about 40%. So just as an example, if you have a 100 megawatt wind farm in our area, you're going to get on average throughout the year about 40 megawatts from that facility. So you're going to have to, you know, for 60%, you're going to have to use a different type of resource to, to meet your needs. Uh, peaking resources, we do have multiple peaking resources in our, our portfolio. Um, these are the resources that are used during times of high electric demand, uh, typically operating in the hot days in the summer, the cold days in the winter. Um, or times when other resources are unavailable, say there is no wind and the wind is down, or maybe there's a forced outage at a coal plant. Um, those are the types of times when these peaking resources operate. Um, we have, uh, like I mentioned, Earl F. Wisdom Station up by Spencer, Iowa. There's two resources there, a steam turbine and a combustion turbine. Both of those units run on natural gas. Both of those units are also capable of operating on fuel oil as a backup during times when our natural gas supply is curtailed, which happens frequently in the winter months. Um, we also purchase power from a combustion turbine in Webster City uh, and from some reciprocating engines in Westerville. Uh, solar resources. So uh, unlike SIPCO, Corn Belt does not own or operate any large utility scale solar arrays. Uh, but we do have some smaller ones that we purchase from throughout our system. And Corn Belt actually does own and operate a 150 kW solar array. It's located at the former coal yard at Earl F. Wisdom Station. And it's a little bit unique because it's split 50-50 between a tracking type resource, so a single axis tracker that follows the sun throughout the day, and then the other half is a fixed tilt resource. And so the reason we did that was to to do a study and show the costs and the benefits of those two different resources. And it has been interesting to see the, the pros and the cons uh, over the, the life of the resource so far. It's been about four or five years that we've had that in service. And the reason I show this picture here, uh, this picture was taken uh, during February 2021. Uh, does everybody remember winter storm URI that, that occurred? Uh, the power grid was very strained at that time. The resources weren't available to meet the load requirements. And as you can see in the picture, the, the sun was shining that day, so both resources were capable of producing at 100% of their capabilities. Uh, the picture on the left shows the single-axis tracking technology. 
and that's one of the benefits. It does a really good job of shedding the snow when it snows in the winter months. The picture on the right is the fixed tilt technology, which does not shed the snow very well. And so we were getting zero output from the fixed tilt array and 100% of the output from the single axis tracker at that time. Um, just on average, just to give you an idea of how well they perform throughout the year, uh, the fixed tilt arrays on average, from what we've seen, perform at about 19% capacity factor. Uh, the single axis trackers are a little bit better. They're up to about 23% capacity factor in our area. So you do get a bit more energy out of the single axis trackers. Um, so changes over the last few years. Um, significant capital investments have been made in a cleaner future at our resources. Uh, the first example being fuel switching up at Earl F. Wisdom Station in 2014. We converted unit number one from coal-fired to natural gas-fired. Um, the unit was originally designed to operate on either coal or natural gas, but in the 70s during the energy crisis, we were no longer allowed to burn natural gas, and so that capability was removed. And so really the project entailed uh, new burners, uh, new underground, above-ground piping, uh, new burner management system, boiler controls, emissions monitoring, uh, the whole works to restore natural gas capabilities. And at that time, we also added the capability to operate that unit on fuel oil. So again, during times of natural gas curtailment, that resource is available to operate on fuel oil. Um, other examples, uh, emissions control equipment installations at the coal resources. Uh, significant amounts of money have been spent in the last 10 to 15 years to add all kinds of different emissions control technology from uh, scrubbers to control sulfur dioxide, uh, selective catalytic or non-catalytic uh, reduction for NOx emissions, activated carbon injection for mercury controls, um, turbine efficiency upgrades, plant efficiency upgrades, uh, anything we can do to, to lower the amount of fuel and therefore lower, lower the emissions per megawatt hour basis. Uh, and then as we look to the future, there was a question on battery storage earlier. Uh, the Corn Belt Board of Directors did approve a battery project in 2020. Uh, that project was completed late last year. Uh, the system is composed of three Tesla Megapack batteries. Uh, capabilities are just shy of a megawatt and a half for six hours at a time. Um, this project's located at one of our existing substations near Hampton, Iowa. Uh, the primary purpose of the project was to learn more about the technology. We see you know, the way we're heading as far as power supply goes, more intermittent resources, uh, and the need to, to store energy at times when the costs are low and discharge them at times when costs are high. And so the primary purpose, you know, for a trial project is to learn more about that technology. How do you specify it? How do you order it? Uh, how do you install it? How do you operate it, maintain it? Uh, things like that. And then the secondary purpose is to provide a benefit to our membership avoid those peak demand charges every month by, by charging the batteries at times when energy costs are low and discharging it at times when costs are high. So changing gears a little bit here, and this is, this is an item kind of where Corn Belt and SIPCO differ a little bit. Um, back in 2009, Corn Belt joined Basin Electric as a Class A member. So at that time, we started selling our generation to Basin, and we purchase all of our power requirements from Basin at their Class A member rates. So you might be asking, why would one, why would one want to do something like that? Uh, really, the strategy was to mitigate risk and to provide rate stability for our membership. So Basin has a very broad, a very diverse power supply portfolio that can be called upon to meet their obligations. And by doing so, they buffer the membership from high price volatility. Uh, so a little bit about Basin Electric, you can see on the map there, they're a very large, um, I mentioned Corn Belt's a generation and transmission for a GNT cooperative. So Basin Electric is what's referred to as a super GNT. So they're a collection of multiple generation and transmission cooperatives. Their service territory spans from the Canadian border and all the way to the Mexican border in the south and cover a huge, huge area in the Midwest. So this chart here, this shows how Basin's generation portfolio has changed in the last 21 years. 
Um, and really, this does a great job of showing what we mean when we say you know, all of the above approach to power supply. Uh, they've gone, you know, in this time, they've gone from almost 85% coal to less than 40% of their generation capacity. Um, also during this time, 80% of their, their new uh, growth, their load growth, has been met with wind, natural gas, or market purchases. And so Basin has over 1,800 megawatts of wind generation in their portfolio. Uh, looking to the future as their, their needs are forecast to increase, they've committed to more than 200 megawatts of additional wind and 300 megawatts of solar. And so wrapping it up here, what that means as they, as they, they meet their power supply obligations with newer, cleaner technologies, um, this chart shows how that carbon intensity has declined over time as that generation is added. Uh, the lower carbon resources have resulted in almost a 32% decrease in their carbon emissions per megawatt hour. And so that's all I had for slides today, I guess, in closing, um, you know, like I said at the onset, there is no one resource that's the magic bullet that can uh, to provide safe, affordable, and reliable electricity. It really does take a really good mix of resources to accomplish that. So, yeah. Have you lost hydroelectric uh, service? Because I noticed your reduction was quite a bit between. So, so there hasn't been a reduction in the amount of hydro. It's just that the percentage has decreased as our load has increased over time. Yep. Yep. Um, let me think. <laughs> oh, on that on that chart there, you didn't have for basin. The percentage of solar, you said 300 megawatts, but what's the percentage of solar? I'd have to crunch the numbers quick. It'd, um, it'd, be, it'd be fairly small compared to some of their other resources, but. Yeah, so I, I think most of their solar they're looking at uh, in the Dakotas right now. Jake, the, uh, are you familiar with the fire station? Are they, are, they, are they part of the basin power grid? They're just an independent. I'm not sure who operates that one. I think it's Missouri Basin. But, um, the other question was batteries. Yep. And with respect to batteries on consumer level, is that anything that's going to be feasible in the near future? People having solar array, but then a battery backup in their home in case of, mm -hmm. you, know, you live out in the country and you lose power. Yep, so, yep. so I have heard some folks throughout the Corn Belt territory, um, they've gone in with a solar array and they have installed like an emergency backup battery. So there are folks that are looking into that. I don't think it's very popular at the moment. I think the costs are maybe a little bit prohibitive still. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Carrie, um, Jake. Uh, that's really great information. It's a question I get a lot from um, from members as you know, like you that how much of our um, generation is becoming more renewable. And I think you can see that, you know, our GNTs and our electric distribution cooperatives are making big strides to moving towards more renewable, cleaner, healthier energy. So uh, great information, you guys. Thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is kind of one of our own here at Midland Power, uh, Larry Belke. Larry's an energy, uh, energy service advisor here at Midland. Uh, and he's recently chaired an EV electric vehicle task force for Midland Power. Um, we put together a group to kind of fish out all the benefits and some of the, 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 the hiccups and some of the things that we might be up against as we adapt to EVs. Um, so please join me in welcoming Larry Belke. My, my mic is working there. Okay. Well, thanks for everyone for coming today to our Midland Powers um, Earth Day event. 
And uh, like Roger said, um, I'm Larry Belke. I work out of our Humboldt office and um, was uh, chosen to be chairman of our EV task force. Our, our manager, Bill McKim, asked us to start taking a look at EVs to see how they are going to affect, you know, Midland Power in general. And that's really a lot what I'm going to talk about today is how um, it's how we're looking at it and what we're doing to become uh, our employees, our board members, educate our board members and our employees on becoming the go-to people that uh, our members can feel comfortable about coming to ask questions about, about EVs and, and uh, energy efficiency and stuff with them. So, um, so the way we looked at it, and we started looking at this back, yeah, I think we developed the committee in uh, April, about a year ago. And uh, after talking about uh, EVs and, and what they might uh, have an effect on our line, the thing that we kind of and wanted to keep an open mind about is um, like anything, heat pumps, everything, EV can be uh, create a, an opportunity for us. And with the right approach uh, and, and, and understanding of EVs, it can present an opportunity for uh, enhancing our rate st uh, stability. So that's what we were after uh, in, in gaining the knowledge so that we can hopefully answer questions to people when they come to us that they have them. So. And uh, here's a little video that we Midland, uh, we formed the EV task force to basically to help educate ourselves first on electric vehicles. Uh, that way we might be able to help and educate our members more. We're wanting to become the, the experts that our members can come to and ask us for advice and for knowledge uh, whenever they need to know uh, what this uh, vehicle might do to their electric bill or how they operate and how they can better use it. Our members are going to be talking to all aspects of our employees, not only the customer service people when they call in, but our linemen out on the lines quite often get uh, questions asked to them by our members. We want them to be able to answer those questions as well. Midland Co-op is, you know, they're forward thinking enough that they know that these these EV vehicles are coming. People are intrigued by them, you know, and I think the linemen being here today, looking at it, talking questions, you know, they're the ones that are, you know, getting the, the lines to these, either residential areas or even into a farmstead or whatever. You know, they, they've got to know what kind of capacity these things take, how many, is there out there, how many could be out there, and what's their demand for their substations to handle all this. Uh, electric vehicles have their place for the people that uh, want to use them, but then you also have our fossil fuels, our ethanol industry, and you're not going to be able to just all of a sudden flip a switch and go from all fuel transportation to all electric transportation. There's going to be that time in there where it's going to be 25, 75, and so on. As far as transportation future, I believe it'll be an all aspects, whether it be fuel or electric, we, we support them all. You can't just rely strictly on one source of fuel for our transportation. You're going to have uh, fossil fuels and you're going to have electricity and it's going to take a mixture of both to make this work for us. Oh. PHEVs is, um, that's plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So they both have batteries that plug in and charge as well as uh, um, a gas engine to them. So uh, currently Iowa has uh, roughly 10,700 either EVs or PHEVs and that is roughly a 60-40 split. There's about 6,000 full EVs and about 4,000 of the plug-in hybrids. Um, counties that are served uh, by Midland Power in and around Ames, up to Iowa Falls, the Humboldt, Algona area. Um, we've seen uh, registrations uh, increase by 50% over the last two years. 
Uh, roughly in our service territory, we have just about 700 um, EVs and PHEVs right of now. Um, also, studies have shown that uh, uh, through questionnaires and con asking consumers what their thoughts are on an EV, 50% uh, of the people that are planning on purchasing a new vehicle are very interested in researching, uh, doing some kind of an EV. Um, one thing that goes along with that and uh, where the power is going to come from is 80% of the charging that is going to be done for an EV is going to be done at a person's home. So our members will be charging, that energy is going to be coming from Midland Power. Uh, so we are hoping to be able to educate people on, you know, proper, if you can charge at times at night and offsetting peak times, that's what's ideal. Uh, we also looked at what we might have to do with our infrastructure um, and, and adapting to EVs. And uh, we expect to see the highest concentrations of EVs probably around our Ames area generally because of the concentration of people, the higher population, Boone County, Story County areas. Um, the, right now our uh, substation, substation loads that we've looked at, they're, they're quite adequate yet to handle um, more, uh, more consumption coming from EVs. And so our, the loading that we have on those substations will be able to handle some, uh, have plenty of cash capacity for that. Um, we, um, looking forward into our work plans, we are expecting, you know, added load growth by all means, um, not only just from EVs, but from residential and, and industrial areas as well. Um, we're going to probably, we use a lot more uh, modern and enhanced uh, equipment in these transformers, like uh, automatic switching for breakers and and, and uh, automatic monitoring of what the load's going on at all times uh, through our SCADA system that we have. Um, software alone with the metering, metering systems that we have now, uh, we're able to uh, be able to watch uh, a consumer's consumption. On, uh, we get 15-minute uh, readings, so we're able to tell what kind of loading is going on on our, not only on, our, on that particular home, but uh, all the equipment that's involved in it with all the service lines and the transformers uh, that are being affected by this extra load. So, uh, planning for the EVs. Uh, that's one thing that uh, we're going to have to stay, stay up on and stay active in is um, transformers. They may need to be upgraded in order to handle the additional load that, that EVs can uh, put on our line. Um, in some cases, you might not just only do a, a, have to upgrade a transformer, you're going to have to upgrade the service lines that go to it as well. Uh, services in the home may need to be upgraded. Uh, somebody who just has a, a typical 60 or 100 amp service, when you start adding on uh, an, uh, a level two charger, which can use up to upwards towards 11,000 to 19,000 watts. Uh, you may need to have that looked at uh, when you make that purchase of that vehicle. So, uh, so what? So what people can do that may be having one or thinking about purchasing a one is if you do get and purchase one, if you were would be willing to register that EV or, or PHEV with us here at Midland Power. Uh, you can go to our website, midlandpower.coop slash EV. Um, another thing to, if possible, our peak times are from four in the afternoon till 9 p.m. if you can avoid charging your EV at those times. Um, and also take advantage, uh, we have a, an EV, a level two EV charger rebate. Now, um, a level one charger is usually the charger that you get with the vehicle. And that will just plug into a normal 120 volt outlet. Uh, it's only gonna use roughly 
1800 watts. So that's not a whole lot more than a hair dryer. Hair dryer will use about 1200 watts. Well, an EV charger, uh, 1800 watts. So, but when you um, install a level two charger, that consumes, it's a 240 volt charger and consumes a lot more energy, like say up to uh, roughly 19,000 watts at a time. So, and we do have a, a rebate for that size of charger. Um, it's 50% of the cost of the charger up to $500. So if you spend, a thousand, were to spend $1,000 on that level two charger, you would be um, available for $500 of that. Um, we're also going to be having uh, more online tools on our website uh, that you can go in and take a look at to see what your costs might be to operate that EV, as well as looking to see where uh, more public charging stations have become available, which is constantly, continually to grow with new chargers being added. Um, and we're going to have um, hopefully more events kind of like this. So if you keep keep your eye open on our on our website and, and follow our Facebook page, uh, you can learn and be able to participate in more events like today. So, does anybody have any other questions on that? Oh, I turned it off. So the difference between a level one and level two is the time it takes to charge. I mean, it's just faster with a level two, right? Correct. You, uh, your level one charger will, if you're going from like 20% battery up to 80%, that's still, that still can be from anywhere from 12 to 16 hours to get that charge in, where a level two charger should do that in anywhere from six to eight hours. So basically overnight you can go to have a... So it reduces it by half? Two Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Your, your rate structures for different times of the day for charging, uh, how does, do you have that or how do you handle that? Currently right now, we are, we just have a two, what we call a two tiered charging, um, uh, charges uh, rate structure for that. You're, it, it's not based on your time of use at the time when you're actually using your power. Um, but we have looking at all aspects of different rates possibly to follow that uh, could include possibly time of use rates where the different times of the day would cost different amounts and we're and also looking at uh, what is called a demand rate. Uh, demand rate is basically based on the total amount of energy you are drawing at one single time. But these are all um, rates that are that we are going to be actively doing a cost of service study this summer to uh, be forward looking to see what kind of a rate structure we need, do need to develop for EVs. Oh, one over here. At this time, you know, in all electric homes, there's two metering devices on your homes. Correct. This one, this for the the EV charger, it has to be connected to the one that's the normal rates, not the, the heating and cooling rate, correct? Correct, yes. It would be the possibility of being seeing out this is energy efficiency, being able to put that on that meter or on that service just for cutting costs and for promoting this type of an application? Well, I think um, the, the heat is a credit that we get from our power supplier. So that's why we need to maintain and be able to see what just that heating appliance is doing. But as far as a vehicle, that would be basically fall in the same categories like your water heater. That still would need to be tied to your main service and your main meter. So when you talk about the level one and level two charger, mm -hmm. For those outlets, when a person's building a home or planning for that, you need to maybe possibly have it in the in the wiring area in the, in the 
layout is to be able to capably changing that from 120 to a 240 volt. Feed. That's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Right. If you're if you're doing any kind of remodeling or building a new home, if if you are the type of person that thinks, yes, I might want to have an EV or use one, it would be that would be the perfect time to install at least the basic wiring that you would be able to just uh, finally, when you do purchase that EV and get that level two charger, that you'd be able to bring it home and just basically plug it in. Because of the codes now, they require outlets in each bay of a, of a garage. So being able to easily go from a 120 to 240 volts. Right, because you, the you're going to be also installing a lot heavier wire to that particular outlet. So right, you definitely want to do some planning and get it installed where it's going to be. Because a, a lot of these level two chargers, if you want, you can actually get one of them that's got two plugs on it, and you'd want to be able to have that so you have access to both vehicles with it. So, so as more people use electric vehicles instead of gas vehicles. What is the government thinking about road use taxes? Road use taxes. How are they um, going to make up for the short? Fall? Right. Okay. So what, what we've been seeing, and I know what uh, the state of Iowa has been looking at is you are going to pay your road tax with your registration instead of a vehicle, maybe your, your registration fee for your, uh, your gas powered pickup is $200. If you buy an EV, that might be $300 to pay, to make up for that gas tax that you will not be paying. So that's how I know state I was looking at that. Uh, first one, a couple comments. I, uh, I bought an, an EV a year ago, last February. Mm -hmm. So to kind of address yours, I put in a NEMA 614 220, you know, 220 volt outlet in the garage, wired with number six wire. So, uh, and and so I charge that. And so just to kind of track where I was going, it's not a it's not an exact track, but I went back five years uh, and pulled my rate uh, that I was paying for five years and did a five year average and then compared the new months. And I'm somewhere between 14 and $20 a month difference in my bill uh, for that. So, and, mm -hmm. and it's uh, to answer part of his question, um, the license fee uh, went up uh, about 300 bucks a year. 300. Yeah. So do you feel you have had good savings at that 12 to $1,400, 12 to $14 a month um, increase on your electric bill was well worth the amount of gas saved? Right. I, you know, it's, it's less than half what I would pay for gasoline. Mm -hmm. if I, and I had a Honda Accord that I had for about 34 miles, so that's what I paid for, right. 34 miles. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? This might be more for Midland, but uh, being a member, I want it all. So what would be the chances of you folks coming up with a program that would run a separate line from the transformer over to the garage area, charge the reduced rate like you do on the heat, and uh, give, make sure it's done right. I mean, you can hire somebody. That doesn't mean they know what they're doing. I've experienced a little bit of that with electricians. Mm -hmm. Not your group. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, how do, how do we break into an EV and, and do it the correct way? Existing home, existing garage. You know, that seems like could be quite a bit. So you're wondering how it would be most beneficial to have your hookup put in the garage is I, I how midland mm -hmm. uh, would install a class two i guess or level two's charger uh, from the transformer and and be able to get a discounted rate and also have that done correctly well um 
As far as installing the wiring for a level two charger, that, that basically can be done by any licensed electrician. Okay, so that that installation will be done uh, by uh, uh, an electrical contractor. Um, the rate that a EV has from Midland will be based upon what we find in our next cost of service study as far as whether it, um, whether they point us towards a reduced rate for them or not. Um, like I mentioned with the electric heat, that is actually that rate that you receive for a reduced rate on your electric heat is a credit that we get back from our G and T, or like from Corn Belt Power or Sifco Power. And, and that's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. you have a separate line, right? Monitor the low rate. Yeah. Separate line. Yeah. 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 the heat, you know, it would be a, a mm -hmm. monitoring uh, bottleneck, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is I guess that's something that we'll just have to. We'll have to let the numbers tell us what we can do on that, yeah. opposed to just saying, yeah, we just need to have a lower rate for an EV. Oh, it's all got to be based on what is uh, financially feasible for both Midland Power, SIPCO, Corn Belt Power, and our members, of course, as well. Well, I know from research that the 11.4 cents per kilowatt hour I pay Midland is low nationwide. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, California, it's like 65 cents. And in the summer, my heating rate is like nine point something. And you do a lot more driving in the summer. Uh, the savings uh, of what was proposed would not be material, would not, I mean, the, the complexity of having yet another meter mm -hmm. would far outweigh any benefit. Right. And, and that is uh, possibly one of the benefits of using a time of use rate is it, it eliminates having a completely separate meter or a separate device for that EV and encompassing the whole property through that main meter and giving it the proper, uh, the proper charges that we should have. So. Is there some way that there's a level two uh, char smart charger that would only activate during these uh, non-peak times? The chargers are very, can be programmed to be very intelligent that way. Um, you can program them uh, to, to charge those off-peak hours. Um, and and, and in, in fact, a lot of it, actually, that programming comes from the vehicle itself. The vehicle, you program that into the vehicle, the vehicle's telling a charger basically when I need it, when it needs to come on, when I need power, when I don't need power. So. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't know if I'm reading his question right, but mm -hmm. part of what he's, what I'm thinking he's saying too is Midland take on like a new project mm -hmm. where they help people get that whole thing set up for the EVs. For oh, me, I'm thinking, right. I don't know a lot about it yet, mm -hmm. but you know, getting the getting the level two charger, getting the electrician in to do the work, you know, maybe like I don't know whether Midland could take that on and and have designated people mm -hmm. who would come out and do that in your garage, <laughs> get right. it all set up for you. Um, yeah. Right, and that would be very, um, very beneficial. Uh, it, it'd be clean and, and, and easy uh, for people to, to, to have that. But also there are very qualified contractors out there that also too do need to be involved because uh, it, it is not just Midland Power that they work for, they work for other utilities as well. And uh, they're licensed, um, um, went to all the schooling for the wiring and very capable people are doing that kind of work. When you leave a recommendation from our website, it says mm -hmm. it's talking about uh, plumbing, sure. where you get charges for the electrical channels. 
Oh right, yeah. Give some education on who can who can get you uh, get the equipment installed and stuff for you. Yeah, we can. Every situation is going to be different. Every homeowner is going to be different. Oh yes. So load calculations and all that would have to be done in order to be able to see if the service is big enough to handle handle this additional load. Um, that being said, there's demand metering out there already for for the HVAC side of things limit or shut off your air conditioner when when peak demands are there so something like that would be also be could be added to these evs if it isn't already right i mean you uh you know we do uh load management on on water heaters currently and that same system can be applied to uh an ev if necessary and you can do that several ways you can do that by an individual device and which actually would control the power flow or you can do that also again through programming either the vehicle or the charger. So those are all aspects that we will be looking at with our, with our uh, rate study to see if uh, load management is a is a way to go move forward on that. So. All right, sounds good. Just want to thank everyone for coming again today. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Larry. That's, that's a lot of good information. Um, there's a lot going on with EVs since we started our task force uh, short of a year ago to kind of dissect what's going on, you know, in that in that arena. Things completely changed within an eight month period as far as chargers, the number of vehicles coming out. So everything that we learned in the first couple of months, we pretty much had to throw it out the window and start fresh again because this uh, EV adaption is happening really fast. I think a couple of quick messages that I would like to throw out there to follow up with Larry is a couple of things when it comes to Midland Power is if you're buying an EV, let us know. We, we like to know where those vehicles are located because it comes back to if, you know infrastructure for us if we have to start upgrading certain infrastructures. Um, so we want to know if you're buying an EV, whether you're buying the charger or not. And, uh, you know, charge those things off peak. Charge them at night at this point. And, uh, again, backing up Larry, uh, we're going to be looking at different rate structures that would uh, maybe be more uh, coherent towards, you know, EVs. So. Do you have a midday range in there also? Like on no, we do not have a time of use rate at this point in time. No. Okay. Um, our last speaker today is uh, another Midland employee, Caleb McKim. He's also on our energy services team here at Midland Power. Um, <clears throat> Caleb's, we're bringing Caleb in this morning to talk about another large subject that we run into a lot, which is solar and adaption of solar. Um, big, big subject. Uh, get a lot of calls on this. So I'm going to bring Caleb on board here to kind of fill us in a little bit on what we're doing with solar energy these days. Caleb? This one, so. Yeah. With uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Caleb. I work with Roger, Dan, Larry here at Midland Power with the Energy Services team, and I do a lot with the solar, the interconnections. If you are interested, chances are they'll send you to me, and I'll work with you in your situation, see what works best for you. Uh, so with Midland Power, you have a couple different options if you're interested in solar and what you can do. Uh, we can look at having your own personal array at your home, whether that's ground mount, roof mount, uh, just one that's physically at your property, or we can look at the community solar route, which is we have a community solar array located in Iowa Falls. You can purchase subscriptions to offset usage that way too. Uh, so we'll move forward here. Good. Or what happened here? Cliff? Okay, so personal solar, we'll start there. Uh, so Midland Power is actually part of a group called Iowa Choice Renewables. We were established in 2016 by a group of Iowa RECs. Uh, we're dedicated to, to delivering safe, reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible energy to our members. Uh, we offer credible information, allowing you to make the best decisions about your energy needs. And if you decide, you know, I really do want to go solar, we're happy to offer turnkey 
solar installs as well. So as you're planning for solar, here's a five steps to kind of walk you through the process what it might look like. Uh, if you're planning for solar, step one is just give us a call. Uh, we want to be there with you, help walk you through that process. Uh, what do you need to do? Is there anything that needs done in your service to help prepare to prepare you for this? Um, we'll give you the credible information and walk you through that. Um, step two is let's look at your energy usage. Uh, here at Midland Power, if you're a member of ours, we can come out and do a free energy audit for you. Uh, kind of see what can, what can you do to cut back of, on your electrical usage. Uh, that reduces the size of the system that you would need to invest in and could save you just easy money right there. Uh, step three is get multiple quotes, read reviews, uh, research the local codes, see what tax credits you might be eligible for. Um, I can't stress enough, don't just go with the first contractor out there trying to sell you anything because um, there's there's good ones and bad ones. So getting, I, I say at least three quotes kind of helps insulate you from uh, getting scammed by somebody. Uh, step four is knowing who's responsible for what. Again, if, if you're working with us, Iowa Choice Renewables, that process is usually pretty simple, straightforward. We'll work with you through that. Uh, if you're working through another solar contractor, uh, work with them, see who's responsible for uh, submitting the interconnection agreement. Um, make sure you have the liability insurance. So uh, if anything, God forbid, goes wrong out there, you know you're covered. Um, and step five is let us help connect your system with ours. Uh, so if you've built, built the array, you're, you've got the interconnection agreement completed, we're out there putting in the meter, making sure everything's set up and ready to go. Maybe. Cliff, it's not moving. Okay. So some, some things to consider as you're looking at solar is what are your goals? Is it just is it to save money, help the environment? Maybe you want to be more energy independent. Maybe it's a combination of the three. Um, so when you call us, talk with us, that's probably going to be the first thing I'm going to ask you is what are your goals? How can I help you meet your goals? Um, location is another big one. You know, roof versus ground mount. Uh, do you have any shading on your property? Uh, do you have a good spot where you can put the array that's south facing? Um, south facing, you get a lot better production out of your arrays if you have that opportunity. Uh, cash versus financing. Um, financing just it lengthens your payback period a little bit, so that's something just to kind of keep in mind because uh, you got interest on that. So something just to think about and your lifestyle. Um, are you home from? 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's the window where solar is producing most of its power. So as, as much as you can offset your energy usage to those times, the best that or the better that solar might work for you, uh, that you can see a, a real benefit from having solar. And tax credits, are you eligible? So working with us, anything, any numbers we tell you do not include tax credits unless you would tell us to include them otherwise. Uh, that is for you to do your research on, talk with your accountant, see what you're eligible for. Uh, that, then you can factor that into your payback period. This year is actually our Iowa Falls array, uh, our community solar array. I, I like this because it really shows the, the patterns of what solar can do. Uh, this is just this past week here. Um, you see that as it's, it's, the, it climbs up, that's right about 10 a.m. and when it falls down, that's right about 3 p.m. So again, whatever you can fit to in that window, that's where you can really, with Midland Power, see the best benefit from your solar. So going back to the lifestyle, uh, a couple other things I'll point out. Um, had a couple cloudy days in there um, this past weekend. We had some clouds, some rain came through, and you can kind of see that effect that it had on the solar array there. Uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, there, there's some good companies out there and there's some people that just want to take your money out there. Uh, so some some red flags to watch for, I'm sure you might have heard some of these. What, 
whether you're scrolling through Facebook, listening to the radio, there's people out there trying to get you to, to buy something. If, if you hear things like eliminate your electric bill, go solar for zero down, get paid to go solar, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> you need to talk, you don't need to talk to your solar company. You know, we'll handle all of that. Don't talk to them. Or anyone who's just really being pushy, pushy salesman, they want you to sign something now. Um, those, those, just, those are some little, little things, just some red flags to watch for. Um, if, if anyone's really pushing any of these down for you, um, just something to be aware of. So five ways to avoid them is, well, if you're interested, contact us. You know, we want to help you through that process and make sure that you're getting the best deal that you can get. Uh, one of the nice things about working for a cooperative that I personally love is I work for you. You're the member, you're the owner of the cooperative. You know, ultimately, you're my boss. So I'm here to, how can I help you? I, I, we sincerely do have your best interest in mind. So you give us your goals, we, we will do everything we can to help you meet your goals. Um, get your multiple quotes. So like I said, at least three, that helps you kind of filter out, okay, who's giving you a, a, a good quote and who's trying to get you for everything you're worth. Um, and ask yourself, is, if it, is this too good to be true? My experience is if, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, read the fine print. Um, and research company reviews, you can, you can find them online. Uh, see other people who have gone with these companies, what, what have they had to say about them? And if you have any friends and neighbors who you know of who have gone solar, ask them about their experiences, you know, what did you like? What did you not like? How do you see this working for you in your situation? So go on to community solar now. So if you don't want to have a solar at your own property or you don't have the, you don't want to put something on your roof or you don't have the real estate, maybe your place has a lot of shading, um, community solar might be an option for you if, if you're still really interested to do something. Uh, so we started our program in uh, 2017, March 2017. It's a 20 year program that runs through February of 2037. Uh, the current price per subscription is $595. And one subscription is going to approximately save you about $50 a year on your energy bill. Um, special deal right now, or if you buy 10, you get the 11 for free. Um, you get to see all the benefits of having invested in solar without having to maintain your system, keep it up, no hassle. It's a, you pay that one time $595 fee and forget about it. It's solar uh, crediting on your bill each month. Uh, you can purchase as many subscriptions as would offset 80% of your electric bill for if you're residential, commercial, it's 50%. And yeah, we hassle free for you. Uh, why community solar? Might, why might you want to invest in community solar? It support re use of renewable energy. Um, there's no maintenance or repair responsibilities for you to worry about. No additional insurance costs. Uh, you can enjoy the benefits of solar without actually having to have it installed on your property. And, you keep it up. Um, see, you can see the real energy production online um, as I, on our website. If you go to uh, midlandpower.coop and you look up on the uh, en um, energy efficiency of renewables, go to community solar. There's a link on there where you can see what our community solar array is doing in real time. It's really fascinating to look at. Uh, you can watch it go up and down as clouds come over. And it, it really interesting. Uh, and production credits appear on your monthly bill. Every month you'll see that credit from the community solar. And it keeps your roof and single warranties valid. Nothing's on your roof. So which is right for you? Here's just a little side-by-side -side comparison of uh, what you, might help you figure out if you're interested in solar, uh, what might best meet your goals. Um, so as your community solar, um, it shows up on your electric bill just as your on-site solar would. Um, program eligibility 
Midland Power Community Solar is you must be a member to be eligible for the program. Um, whereas on site, anybody can go put up their own array, regardless of which utility is your provider. Uh, tax credits is with the community solar, you can get the payback without having to be dependent on any tax credits. Um, but if you do uh, go have your own on site solar, make sure you do your research into that and see what you might be eligible for. Um, no land requirements for community solar. You might have some land or at least a really solid roof for your on site solar. Um, with community solar, you can buy a few subscriptions now add more to that later. That's a really easy process. Uh, if you look going to expand on your on-site solar in the future, uh, there would be uh, some hoops you'd still need to jump through then at that time as well. Uh, for the community solar, if you move, they can be transferred to another account. So if you stay on Midland Lines, you can transfer them to your new account on Midland Power, or you can transfer them to another member on Midland Power. Um, Whereas on-site solar, you're most likely just leaving them with, with the property. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so first, how does, how does you have solar on the roof or community solar? How is that, how is that affecting the grid? How does that really work? Affecting the grid? I mean, does your solar power your stuff in your house? Or does the solar, does the energy produced go to Midland and then it comes back through regular Midland wires? How, do, how does that work? Sure. So we'll start with solar on your house. So say you have solar on your house. The energy is connected on your side of the meter. So it'll, you'll be using that power before it would go to us. So the only power generation that we would see coming from you is any overproduction that, so say it's, it's produced more power than you're using at that time, then that would go to us and we would see that, but you will use it all first. Um, the community ones, so that's all located up at Iowa Falls, so that's metered itself. Um, at the end of the month, we take all of the usage or the generation that that has produced over that month, and then we divide that by the number of subscriptions and say you have 10 subscriptions, we'll allocate 10 of those to you. And so you see the kilowatt hours credited onto your bill, it's subtracted from your kilowatt hours that you used for that month. So, so the energy you're getting in your house isn't actually coming from that solar array? From that specific one, from that, not, it's not coming from that specific array. So if you live down in Polk City, you know, it, energy is going to go or path of least resistance and everything. So it's it's going down the road and it'll feed out. But but it's, yeah, but you're getting that credit because you've invested in it. So you've invested in that renewable energy source. And so you're, you're still seeing that benefit because we are then allocating that energy produced by that source to your bill each month. Uh, 595 for a subscription. Yep. What does subscription mean? A subscription is an allocation so if you, there's, there's a formula that we have that we take your energy usage over the course of a year, and then we put that in and we see how many subscriptions you would be eligible for, um, how many allocations for, for what it is. So and you then, might have, how would you figure out whether it's one or two or three subscriptions or something? Uh, there, there's a formula that I put it in. Oh, so it would be through you. Yeah. I'll let other people ask. <laughs> Good questions, though. Good questions. Yeah. So, if you have a solar array and you're connected to Midland, yep. is there <laughs> a, an option to have batteries that would flip over so you maintain uh, your property during the outage? Is there a solution like that? Uh, I'm in rural, you know, I lose water when the done electricity for the well. Yeah. Um, so when you're have when you on just on your on on site solar, there are batteries you can do do for that. Typically general rule of thumb, of course every situation is different, but general rule of thumb is if you're looking to add batteries, roughly double the cost of the system. 
Um, when you lose power, then your solar array will lose power, but you'll still have the batteries to keep your water running. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. To transfer that battery power to your facility and disconnect you from the utility? Yes, there is. Just like if you hook up a generator. Yes. Yep. Just like it's same process. And with respect to that, just from my um, residential codes and the NEC codes relating to solar arrays, um, just because you know something forbid happens at your house, those arrays have to be disconnected from the line because. Emergency people have to be able to disconnect that, to yep. get that off of the grid and away yep. from them, so there's no danger of being electrocuted. Yep, yep. So it's in our one of our requirements. If you go and do put some on-site solar at your property, that there is a disconnect switch within line of sight of the meter. We typically like to see that within 10 feet of the meter, especially, just. So that way, yeah, if, if something does happen, it, it's there, easy access, people know right where to go, where they can flip that switch. So say a person bought 10 subscriptions, Yep. they would get a credit of approximately $500 a year. Yep. If they did use that much electricity for the year, yep. would they get a credit on, would they maintain a credit or how would that? Yeah, that will continue to roll over throughout the uh, duration of the program. So until the program ends, yep. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Back over here. So when you pay the credit, then you're not paying your regular electric bill. The $595 is for your electric bill? The five hundred and ninety five dollars is the subscription price to buy into the program. Okay. So that, that's not your electric bill. So you still have your electric bill over here. You pay that five hundred and ninety five dollars for one subscription. That's a one time fee to buy into the program. Then throughout the duration of the program, that array is going to produce kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. uh, those kilowatt hours will then be credited onto your bill every month as it's produced throughout the duration of the program. So that's where you see your energy savings. So if you use 100 kilowatt hours in a month and the array produces 50 for your subscription allocation, you take your 100 and subtract the 50 here and then you pay the difference. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Or, is that a, is that? So you're basically paying $545 for a subscription above what you normally pay for your electric. Yeah, it, it's a se it's separate, so it's not it's not your utility bill. It's not that. It, it, you just buy into the program, but yeah. Mm. Does, that, does that help clarify it? Yeah, well, sort of. Sort of. I guess that would be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, sure. It, so, yeah. I have, so when you put a solar panel on your roof, and you have to get new shingles, you have to get a new roof. How does that work? Does the roofing company take the solar panels? How do you? No, you do would that? have to, you would have to call the people who installed your solar. They will come and re remove the solar panels and then your roofing company will come and re-roof your house. And then when that's done, then they will come reinstall them. And I would assume that's a pretty big charge. It, yeah, it, it's not cheap. Yeah. And then when you talk to us, do you recommend solar companies that we would contact to get quotes? Uh, sure. I recommend Iowa Choice Renewables. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I said, we, we, of course, we recommend us. Um, and then outside of that, we recommend that you do some, some research. Um, you know, just do a quick search online for solar companies in Iowa, and you'll get a lot of results. That's the company that we're associated with. Yep. Yep. Yes. I want to make sure I understand the subscription. So you said one time charge. Yep. So it's basically an investment for small returns till 2037? Yep, exactly. Okay. Well, yeah. So you, you pay that $595. 
then every month you'll get that credit on your bill for the, for the kilowatt hour difference. And so you're, you're saving money on your electric bill throughout that time until 2037. Yep. So it's hard to say exactly what the benefit it will be when it's done. Yes, these are these are estimations that's been provided to us by the people who installed the array. They're estimations. So the estimation is for your five ninety five, you're going to get over the life about six hundred dollars worth of credits. Yeah, give or take. I have okay. I have some specific numbers. If you're really interested, we can work your situation and give you specifically what it would be. Yeah, um, we can we can talk about that if you're if you are interested. We have another one over here, Dan. Exactly. Yep. Yep. To one time. One time. You pay that once, and you don't pay it again. Yep. I would go live by then. Any other questions? Well. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming. Well, thank you all for coming. The weather's still bad outside. Um, but uh, hopefully you've learned some things today about the co-op, about energy efficiency, about power supply, about solar, about EV. Um, we are working hard to be a, a trusted energy source, somebody you can call and contact and, and find out about some of these things. Um, these guys do work hard at this, and they study this, and we try to invest as a co-op in them. Uh, so that they can answer these questions for you. So I appreciate those that have listened online. Again, to our, our guests from SIPCO and Corn Belt and Mr. Sh Sayers uh, giving up some retirement time to come in and share his expertise. We very much appreciate you guys uh, sharing time today on your Friday afternoon. So, And I'd just say, are there any questions for me or any follow-up questions? Um, I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, but uh, if not, uh, thank you all for coming today and, and enjoy your weekend.